All right, what we got going on here today is the top five uh, books with uh, pretty much the top five battles in comic books, in my opinion. And it's brought to you today by Yuhu, our favorite sugary drink that denies having sugar nor caffeine, but it's pretty good. All right, no real uh, perfect little order here, but uh, this is like my opinion books that I remember with the fights that uh, came in there and uh, you know really kind of stuck out to me as not being a waste or you know stirred up something in me there makes you love comics. I'm going to start out here with pretty much the first five issues of the Baxter edition of Legion of Superheroes. And what we have, what going on here, we had you know Legion of Superheroes in an ultimate battle against uh, Legion of Supervillains. A lot of great fights, a lot of action in there. Uh, Keith Giffen's art is actually, you know, readable in my opinion in this. And, uh, you know, the storyline just blew me away. So, out of everything that's going on in here, the biggest battle was not between all of the uh, huge giants, all the uh, laser beams and shrinking and shadow powers and Ultra Boy and Lightning Lad and everything that's going on. It came down to Karate Kid. He ended up going against Nemesis Kid. Nemesis Kid, for you guys, was a rejected Legionnaire. He's there in the Electro suit. Kind of looks like uh, uh, Johnny Thunder from Earth 2 also there, but this is the future. Anyway, he was rejected, and he actually is able to adapt his body to have the power to defeat anybody that comes up against him. And with that said, it comes down to just a brawl. And, of course, we have Karate Kid being the underdog. Going one-on-one -on -one against Nemesis Kid, who, you know, talks a little bit of smack to him. And they go back and forth while the other battle rages on, man. It's it's dodge, parry, block, punch, punch. And Karate Kid pretty much gets his butt handed to him. And he'll end up sacrificing himself to save his wife, Princess Projectra, and her planet. Okay, moving on here. I believe this goes back to New Gods number 8. Let me just be sure here. I always seem to go blank or think of things to say later after the video is over. Yeah, number 8. This is, of course, a reprint. There's the original Kirby stuff. And this is where the Death Wish of the Terrible Turpin what came up. And basically, Calabac comes and invade, and Turpin is just your average human, bowler cap wearing, cigar, cigar <clears throat> biting cop who's just sick of these superheroes. And if he had these little super beans come up, using you know his city as a, a battleground, and he goes one on one, and there's really no fight to it, he ends up getting his butt handed to him. And when Light Ray and Orion pop up to help him against Calabac, he tries to put them under arrest too. Even though he's sitting there, uh, representing the average man, just just creamed. I mean, he had he just like I said, there was no fight to it. Mm, I'm trying to find a little page there to show you what kind of shape he ended up being in. Here we go. Now for you Kirby guys and stuff, Newsboy Legion. He had Brooklyn. He was uh in the 1940s. There was like this little gang, and they were a gang. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, you know, kind of running around helping out the, the Guardian. And, you know, the beat cop that hung out with them during the day, kind of steered them straight, was the Guardian. They had a character named Brooklyn. Brooklyn wore, he had long red hair, and he wore a bowler cap, and he spoke with a Brooklyn accent. And Kirby Lore says that that was the terrible Turpin. He grew up to be a cop after, I think it was Jim Harper, you know, who was the Guardian. I don't think I've actually ever seen anything that puts this down as this is fact. Just a little thing there for you Curry fanatics. Alright, I did a little video about Doctor Doom and Fantastic Four and Galactus and God a while back and mentioned this fight in here. This is uh, Super Marvel, Super, Super Villain Team Up. I got a few of those. Really love this book. I'm going to try to back up and collect a few more of these. But number three, Submariner Doctor Doom end up fighting, you know, Doctor Dorcas, Tiger Shark, and Atuma. Just to be sure here, I'm on camera. I'm gonna want to go blank. 
but the fight rages on to where you know they're fighting battles going on and doom gets taunted his uh he, he fights so much his armor gets weak and he gets taunted by a little worm there and they're just you know all the mighty doom they're, they're mocking him is what they're doing well you just don't do that to doom doom and excuse my language but if you piss him off he's coming back and get you what he does is he finds out of a Atlantean ship right here uh, basically two rockets two missiles uh, what are they called here you know just high explosive missiles and he smashes them together blows himself up along with them and doom is left standing and the little worm that was mocking him he says oh you want to mark doom you're just as good as doom he points at the guy throws him two more missiles and makes him blow himself up so Mariner tries to have a little talk with him and Doom's more or less you want a piece of this back off that is Doom okay now <clears throat> pretty much Roger Stern John Mishima and Tom Palmer's pinnacle of being on this book the peak of, of just the best best story they laid out would be Avengers 273 to 277 with a little Spider-Man issue thrown in there and this is was the Masters of Evil versus the Avengers they come in they storm the mansion they trash the place they beat up Jarvis while uh, you know Captain America is looking they pick up Hercules Goliath does and he just spins around using Hercules as a bat taking out everybody and it just in it finally comes down to uh, you know, they just rip Hercules a new one. I have a little Spider-Man crossover there. This is Amazing Spider-Man 283. Uh, just everything came in. Reinforcements came in. And it came down to a fight between uh, Baron Zemo, not the original one, I assume it's his son, and Captain America. Uh, the whole thing is just one of the great tight little stories where no scene is wasted uh, it's explored the best it could under its comics code and it's just it just changed the book there for like the next five six seven years and it wasn't even considered an event anyway when I read it I was in middle school and I just reread it and reread it and reread it and I always had to keep it to where I could get a handle on it because you know this is Tom Palmer inks on John Bushima the storytelling everything was just great the next story that I have one of the second greatest fights I've ever seen, in my opinion. And I really had to go back and forth with this one. I had to keep nostalgia and, and the time period. In fact, it's a Kirby story in, in, from getting me, but I have not reprint. This is my Fantastic Four number three, annual number three. And it reprints... Uh, the first Hulk versus Thing story. Hulk showed up in New York. Um, oh, I apologize. Let me hurry and get this. Maybe I've grabbed the wrong one. I don't know. But anyway, it was the Fantastic Four. It reprints Fantastic Four uh, 26, 26, and 27. I believe this is the wrong one. Hmm. Mm -hmm -hmm. how embarrassing all right so basically what happened was Hulk comes to New York and in Fantastic Four 26 and 27 you had the thing pop up because the Hulk pretty much has just laid everybody out and the thing pops up he comes up there and uh, it pretty much hands the thing its butt but the thing was the underdog I think he wondered if he was strong enough to do it probably did not help him considering he was still adjusting to be a monster not being loved and being teased by Johnny and everything and all of a sudden you know he gets his butt handed to him by the Hulk in front of everybody hmm and I grabbed the wrong annual I got two or three of these ones oh well moving on now the greatest and I went back and forth but I feel that the greatest greatest story uh, the greatest battle in comics there was done by Paul Smith and James Robinson. This is the Golden Age. Came out in the early 90s. I think it was around 93, 94. And at first, I did not want to get these books because I thought they were just trying to watchman eyes. 
the uh, you know the All Star Squadron and the Justice Society. It was quite a bit more than that. And there was four issues. I got three here. I'm looking for number two. If anybody out there, you know, has an offer. But Paul Smith has a background in animation. I want to say that he worked with uh, maybe Bakshi or somebody, you know, late 70s, early 80s, and a few other things. And I think he really became famous on some X-Men. But basically, what we have here, this character is actually one of the greatest evils in the real world ever. I'm gonna, there's a brain transplant. I'm not going to sit there and ruin it for you. But he's basically been given the body of Superman without there being a Superman in, you know, the new Golden Age. This book kind of goes from the Golden Age to the Silver Age. And it, you know, hasn't really been, it's an Elseworlds Worlds book, but I, I think it could be a really good prequel to New Frontier. Okay. So basically, just the way this book is coordinated, all the heroes are coming after him. And this thing, the storyboard and the layout, the violence, everything that's going on in here, it just plays out to where it's clear, it's crisp, it's full of drama, it's through violence. And I don't, I know these pictures aren't helping you, but uh, just one of the greatest, greatest. I mean, it's got a ball kick shot, and it just, uh, I mean, they just go at it and at it. It's the return of heroes. Green Lantern finally gets off his butt and enters the. The hero business again after the 50s commission wiped him out. You get Starman coming out of the asylum to come in there. I mean, just look at that punch. Teeth are flying. Well, anyway, Golden Age number four. Greatest superhero battle in comics ever, in my opinion. Moving on here. A few things that uh, I'm going to throw out there that didn't really make my top five. They should get honorable mentions is uh this is my new frontiers volume one and new frontier is an elseworld story also which i don't think it should be but it starts out in uh the pacific 1945 on a little island the losers have landed on it and over a course of i don't know five days to a week or something the losers are getting killed by they don't know what and johnny cloud of the losers is telling the story on a cave letting people know they were there And it's not really a fight, but he ends up coming face to face. He's the last one. And he comes face to face with a T Rex, a huge T Rex. He pops the little grenades here at the bottom after stirring it down, giving us some uh, monologue. Jumps into the mouth of the T Rex and blows it up. And this little epilogue that just ends is just pure poetry. Now, this is John Cloud. He was an Indian, American, Native American, in, uh, in the. Army Air Force back then. He goes, ask my family and they'll tell you I was a Navajo. Ask the Army Air Force and they'll t say I was an American. But if you ask my brothers, they'll set you straight. John Cloud was a loser. After reading the whole story and getting to that part, it just... Touching. Alright. Future I'm Imperfect. Number one and two. Number one. Number two, as the Hulk of the future, the maestro. And this book climaxes with the Hulk more or less fighting the future version of himself. And it takes place in... I don't want to ruin the story though, but there's been nuclear war. The Hulk became stronger. Everybody else sort of didn't survive. And somebody in the book, um, which if you're into Hulk and stuff, you wouldn't be surprised who it was has a whole like little secret basement and he's of memorabilia that he found in the superheroes after the wreckage he's got helmets of all the heroes nova anybody wore a helmet he's got a little thing of daredevil he's got a sentinel head with uh, ben grimm's rocks rocky hide laying in him so on and so forth and in the fight with the maestro um the hulk more or less stabs the maestro in the chest with captain america's shield and it just goes on from there on how it ends one I didn't want to go with but of course it was so obvious was Frank Miller's Dark Knight returns with Superman and Batman going at it um, it was just such an obvious number one because of what it did to everybody's perceptions of the comics and the fact that it showed that Batman can beat anybody's butt my problem is 
even though Batman was well, well prepared for Batmobile, he has the bat armor on, and he has Kryptonite involved, and he has Green Lantern coming in. Batman cannot be Superman, in my opinion, no matter how well he's prepared. What else we got here? I think that's uh, maybe all we got. Two other books that I decided not to put in this that were honorable mentions, just that, man, I'm a fan. Probably the uh, Justice League number five, right before they came Justice League International. It had uh, Batman versus Guy Gardner. The reason I love that story is not only was it funny, but when I saw the cover and it announced that it was Batman versus Guy Gardner, I was like, there's no fight there. Batman went in one punch. You open up the book, you read it, Batman wins in one punch. The other one was Crisis on Infinite Earths number seven. It was the death of uh, Supergirl. And it was called Into That Silent Night, I think. And it was just, it just blew me away. Supergirl dies. And she dies for a purpose to get everybody out of the, out of the give everybody time to get out of the uh, antimatter universe. Goes up against the anti-monitor and just gets wiped out. And I didn't put it in here because basically they finally gave us a really classic Supergirl story after she's been around for so long. Uh, it was a great story. It was a great chapter in Crisis on Infinite Earth, and I had to go back and forth on that one. Okay, guys, um, real quick here, if y'all got a minute, I'm going to show you a little bit of artwork I have here. This is a little sketch I did uh, a couple years ago when I was just sort of sitting, having lunch. I used to have a job where I drove to clients' houses a whole lot. You can see this. And what I've drawn there is Creature from the Lack Lagoon carrying, you know, a chick from the Planet of the Apes. Just kind of flowed out of me there. And uh, I'll probably be having another video today, so, uh, you know, fill out this weekend. So I hope you liked it. Uh, throw me a few of your favorite battles, a few thoughts. Apologize for not having my Fantastic Four reprint correct. But, you know, you know, maybe if I rehearsed, it would be more fun. But, yeah, I like spontaneous. See you later.